lecture about today is renewable energy, how we power the boat and what we chose to use and hopefully that will help you make some informed decisions when you come to set off and leave for your travels. There are many different types of boat batteries. There are sealed batteries, gel batteries, there are lithium batteries. They all do different things uh, and work in different ways, but the basic principle is the same. They hold energy. Now, our battery bank, we use six volt golf cart batteries. We use the Trojan batteries because they, we can fit more batteries into the space that we have. So we have 450 amp hours of battery power to power this boat. Amp hours is a unit of battery, which essentially means that we, we, if, if we have a light, for instance, that draws one amp, we can use 450 hours of that before the battery is flat. However, there are lots of differences and lots of variations in that. The first thing you need to be aware of is that if you have 450 battery hours or amp hours, when you get to 50% of that in a regular battery, your batteries are effectively flat. So you only have half of that available. So we have 225 amp hours of power. Lithium batteries are different in that you can use about 80% of the available power, but we use lead acid batteries, which are much, much cheaper. And hence we get about 50%. All I would say is that our batteries cost about 200, 150 to $200 each. Whereas a lithium battery is the same, similar lithium battery is about $2,000. So there's a massive price point difference. So that's how we store the energy. How we use the energy, that's fairly straightforward, but you need to know what on your boat is gonna use the energy. The biggest use of energy while we're at anchor is the fridge. We live in the tropics and we have to have a fridge now. It is useful if you are planning to go forth and live either in the tropics or anywhere at your boat, you need to know what your energy consumptions are. Now that's easy to do. You can do it on paper by working out what the use uh, what the amp draw of each component that you use regularly is going to be. However, the manufacturer's draw will be very different in many cases to what you actually draw. For this point, I would suggest that if you are fitting out a boat and you don't already have one, spend some money on a good quality battery monitor. Now, we have a BMV, I think it's a 600. And what that does, it is, has something called a shunt. And a shunt is a very sensitive piece of copper it's like a copper uh, it's like a copper bar that exists between the battery out and the distribution to the panel and that can monitor very precisely how much how much power we're using it gives a digital, little digital display and that will show the voltage of the batteries the current draw and the current current in and current out so we can monitor exactly how much we're using. It also, once we've set it up, will tell us a basic percentage of how much battery power we've got. Now this is different to a lot of systems on boats that just have five little lights, which five lights is full, four lights is 80% and so on. But unless you have a dedicated shunt, you are never gonna have a good idea of what's going on. So I really do recommend battery monitors just full disclosure here, we're not endorsing any product. There are loads of fantastic products on the market, but one which has a shunt and gives you a readout um, is probably my recommendation. So we talk, or we're talking very briefly about what uses power. So when we're under sail, navigation equipment uses power. When we're at anchor and when we're under sail, the fridge uses power. While we're here, there are lights, there are electric toilets, you have those, there are pumps, there are fans that we have going. It, it all adds up. So you need to have, I would suggest, enough battery reserve power to do at least 48 hours without needing to recharge the batteries. The other thing that a lot of people have talked to us about is how their batteries fare over time. Now, the average lifespan of a lead acid battery is about five years. So they become less effective as they get older. You end up with less power to use. And so if your batteries aren't holding charge or they're discharging too fast, look at the date they are, that they were purchased. And if you just bought a new boat, possibly look to buying new ones if, if they're not holding charge. 
So that's how batteries are, how the, the energy is used. It's really important now to work out how to charge the batteries. Now, if you have a, a yacht with an, an inboard engine, it will have an alternator and that alternator will be rated at 50, 80, even 100 amps. The most basic way of charging your batteries is to use the engine, run the engine to charge the batteries. A 50 amp alternator will theoretically put 50 amps into the engine, into the batteries for every hour that you run it. However, they never really run at 100% capacity, so you may find that a 50 amp alternator will put 40 in. But it's a little bit like blowing up a balloon. The more air you get into it, the more difficult it is to blow up. So as the batteries become more full, it will put less and less into the batteries. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, if you've got shore power on your boat so that when you get to a marina you can plug in, you will have a battery charger. It should theoretically be a four-stage smart charger so that you can't overcharge your batteries. When you plug the shore power in, it will charge them up for you much like a battery charger at home will, do, will work and you will find that in that case you have charged batteries. The obvious downside to this is that as soon as you pull away from the marina and leave the marina, you have no way of recharging. We tend to find that the engine auto is a really, really good way of charging batteries. Now, there used to be a lot of discussion about how if you used your engine to charge your batteries only, it would cause problems with the engine in the long term. Something called glazing the pistons. Now, we did masses of research on this, huge amounts of research, because everyone says, oh yeah, it will glaze your pistons, but no one's ever told me what that actually happens. So a couple of months ago I sat down with some friends and did some research on this and it transpires that in modern engines, so let me just say less than 10 years old, there's no such thing. There is no harm from running the engine to charge the battery for an hour a day. It doesn't do it that much damage. The other thing people always say is well if you use the alternator it puts the engine under load anyway. That again after research was found to be urban myth. So again shoot me down, tell me I'm different. I'd like to know that if I'm wrong on that, but that's the research that we did. So engine alternator number one. Then we move to our renewables. Now, the other thing I want to say is that a lot of people then move to gen sets using a generator either built into the boat or a small external suitcase generator. This boat doesn't have the room to put a generator in, so we obviously don't have one. But essentially a generator, a genset, is a small diesel engine that uses the, main, the fuel tank from, the main, uh, from the, the main boat's fuel tank and essentially powers the boat. We'd, we'd love to have one. Um, the big problem is that people, we seem to find people, wherever we go, continually fixing their gensets. It seems to be a huge problem that my genset's broken and my genset needs something. It's not the engine, but I think small diesel, diesel generators tend to have more problems than other parts of boats. So we don't have one, it's not sour grapes because we don't have one, but again, just mentioning that's another good way of powering your boat. External suitcase generators, these are exactly what they say they are. They're small generators, probably about the size of a small suitcase. One, two kilowatt generators that you can buy relatively inexpensively for say two, three hundred pounds, going up to the really kind of top mark ones at a couple of thousand pounds. In those cases, they work exactly the same way, but you have to put petrol in them. That means that you have to keep flammable liquid on board, flammable petrol. We would probably have one, but we have found that we don't need one. So the next thing is solar. Now we have, we love solar. We have two 100 watt solar panels. They produce a full output, 5.25 amps each. So we theoretically get 10 amps, but over here in the Caribbean, we don't get as much. We find that we get probably about eight amps a day, eight amps an hour at full sunlight. And we can only guarantee that for about four hours a day. So say between about 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. The other thing is those panels are very sensitive to any shadow falling across them. So if you get a tiny little bit of shadow from like a shroud or a sail, then you find that you end up losing power almost completely from the covered panel. So be aware that solar has to be placed where it gets the least uh, shade. We see a lot of boats with outriggers, and I think they're a good idea, although aesthetically they may compromise the look of the boat where the panel is held on the side of the boat and you kind of put it out um, like a, the petals of a flower to pick up the sun. Again, really good for power. 
The next thing we have is a wind generator. Now we love our wind generator and I don't think I'd ever be without one. I would, can say that if you were going to put renew whatever renewables you were going to put in first, I would say wind comes first. That's just for us. Now our wind generator sits on the back of the boat on a pole. It works when there's wind, obviously, but it works really well. And the difference here is that it, as long as there's wind, it works day and night, day and night. In the Caribbean, where there are trade winds, you will find that you will have some power all day long. Um, the model that we have is a quality model so that it produces a lot of power when there's wind above 15, 16 knots. So in a, on a windy day, we can power and charge everything just with the wind generator alone. One thing to bear in mind, though, is if you are doing trade wind sailing, that the wind generators don't work so well when you're sailing downwind because your apparent wind will be less than your actual wind. If you're sailing downwind at seven knots with a 20 knot wind, your apparent wind is only 13 and that seven knot difference will make a big uh, change to how much power you can get out of your wind generator. The final thing that we use is a hydro generator. Now, I would probably only recommend these for people doing long offshore passages. Essentially, it's a leg that looks a bit like a, uh, an outboard leg that sits in the water and the little propeller turns with the motion of the boat. And what that does is it generates power, just like a little generator. Really fantastic, super efficient and very expensive. Uh, ours is a Watton C version although there are others on the market. Very clever, very pretty and very functional, but again, really suited to people doing offshore sailing at distance where you need to generate power um, and solar and wind won't give you what you need. So those are the, those are the things that we use. Um, I would suggest that depending on, on the sailing that you propose to do, your geographic location, and your realistic season, first season sailing plans, you should start with some and maybe move to the Nautilus later on. As long as you are not going to crazy distant places first year or season one, you can pick all this stuff cheaper elsewhere in the world. And that's probably what I would suggest. You know, we've been to places like St. Martin where you can buy things very cheaply. The USA here is very cheap for us to buy equipment. So, you know, put the bits onto your boat as you need to. You don't need to set off with a full kind of a boat bristling with renewables. Um, and it's only really from our experience that when we moved to living on board, we actually worked out what we actually needed rather than what we thought we would need. And there is a difference between the two. You'll only, only you'll be able to find this out as you kind of carry on with your sailing. Obviously, any questions, just please ask, write down, or find us on our Facebook page. Again, this, these little videos have just come from people saying, how do you do this? How would you do this? From a couple that have done two years of this offshore sailing and two years of living on board. And hopefully it will answer some of the questions that we would have loved to have answered when we set off. Thanks so much. Come Everyone's on. gonna ask where I am on the video. <laughs> I'll do the thanks for watching bit. Right. So thanks so much for watching this week's video. Obviously I just took myself out of the frame because all this stuff makes my eyes glaze over and I'm still not entirely sure that I even know what an amp power is. <laughs> so I hope that you found that useful and to the people watching who actually find this kind of stuff interesting or relevant then I hope you found it informative as well. Um, as always, ask all your questions down below in the comments section. We, you can always email us or find us on Facebook and message us. We love to hear from you guys. So any other questions that you want answered, please give us a shout. Um, otherwise, as ever, please subscribe and please join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, our website, everything down below. And uh, we'll see you very soon with another video.